Hey Jordan, I've got four cameras here, but I only have two hands. Like, what am I supposed to do? I edit, you present, you figure it out. <sighs> Your job. Fine. Welcome back, Deep Review TV viewers. Chris Knuckles here from Deep Your Review, and today what we have is a roundup slash kind of buyer's guide. And what we really want to talk about today is the power of the APS-C and Micro Four Thirds cameras, and that. I still feel that the smaller sensor cameras offer a lot of versatility and can handle every kind of photography. And I would almost say that the larger full frame cameras are definitely more specialized tools in a lot of ways. And so today we're looking at four cameras, the Nikon D500, the Fujifilm X-T3, I've got the EM1 Mark II from Olympus, and I've got the Panasonic G9. Now you might be saying, well, where's the Canon 70 Mark II and where's the Sony a6500? We really wanted to test the best professional crop bodies on the market and by best we mean these all have incredibly rugged bodies these all have the latest autofocus capabilities of those brands as well as the most powerful processors and so that's why we've chosen to omit them also the video would be like half an hour long now what we want to do is take these through five different kinds of photography but don't forget we're going to go through this very quickly okay if you want more detailed information on these cameras check out our youtube video reviews of these cameras or go to deepyourview.com and see the amazing articles they've done on these cameras as well. All right, let's get to it. Okay, so let's talk about landscape to start off things. And when it comes to landscapes, I guess you need really ugly locations with really hideous light. That doesn't sound right. The opposite is better. Oh, okay, so we're not gonna give you a nice landscape today, but when it comes to cameras, what's important? Well, things like autofocus are gonna take a back seat naturally to things like dynamic range, resolution, and low light performance. So sensors are a big part of this game, but at the same time, technology also plays a part. All right, so to start things off at the bottom, I'm gonna give it to the Nikon D500. This was a very difficult choice, but it's just not really made for landscape specifically. It takes beautiful photos, but the sensor's a little bit lower res, and on top of that, it comes down to the larger body weight and size. That's a big detriment for landscape for me. I want a portable light camera because that means lighter tripods, lighter filters, lighter lenses, everything gets smaller, and that can be beneficial. Landscape's not always about stationary, big, heavy tripods. It's about moving, traveling, exploring, and that's where a smaller, lighter camera gives us bigger benefits. Okay, now for the sake of brevity, I'm gonna put both these cameras together as a tie. We've got the Olympus OM-D EM1 Mark II and the Panasonic G9, both rugged, portable light cameras. I love that they both have effective inbuilt stabilization so that you can handhold these things on your traveling excursions. On top of that, you can get away with lighter tripods when you are gonna do that kind of photography. You've also got some great technology with the 6K photo modes on the Panasonic. I like the post-focus capability. I like the focus stacking capability for some interesting creativity, and Olympus has one of the nicest night modes where you just see in live view your exposure build and stop it when you're happy with it. It's brilliant. But on top of that, if you're going to complain about the 20 megapixel resolution, keep in mind that these both have multi-shot mode, which can easily quadruple your resolution when the situation fits it so you can get those large prints. All right, so for the win of the landscape, I'm gonna give it to the Fuji X-T3, but just by a smidge, just barely. And really, it's gonna come down to the heart of that highly effective, high-resolution APS-C sensor. Great dynamic range, decent low-light performance, but also significantly more resolution than the other cameras when you're doing a one-shot kind of mode. But on top of that, we have the portability and the ruggedness that's inherent in this small body. There's some excellent lenses out there, and it's a great camera to travel with. Still, there are some big downsides. We don't have any really interesting creative landscape stuff like focus stacking for example but at the same time we also don't have ibis so this camera can get away with a smaller tripod but you're probably gonna want to bring it still by a hair it's the xt3 all right, so as you can see, we're on the street, so that brings us to street photography. What I personally look for, I need fast autofocus. I want a camera that's gonna be able to shoot from different angles as well quite easily, so live view focus is a great feature as well. I want the camera to have decent low light performance, but I also want it to be discreet and compact. If not to be secretive, at least just to make it easier to carry around. So, starting number four, let's go with our first camera. All right, the bottom of the list is the Nikon D500, but don't get me wrong, it's totally capable. I love the fast autofocus, and I love the fast continuous shooting rate, and the image quality is exceptional. Downsides are gonna be the big, bulky, heavy body, and the fact that when you do wanna shoot off the screen, it's got the slowest live view autofocus. The other cameras just do a better job with a smaller body. 
All right, so next up we've got the Olympus EM1 Mark II. I love the body design. It's very compact, looks really nice with small lenses, great articulating screen, and fantastic manual controls. My only real complaints about this camera is they're overly complicated, so you gotta get used to it. And the Panasonic's gonna win out just slightly because of some advanced features. Okay, now just slightly above the Olympus because they're so close is the Panasonic G9, but I do like some of the notable features here. Way better viewfinder on this camera. It does have significantly faster single point autofocus, which is great for street. I also like its more effective eye detect autofocus, and this camera also has a slightly better 4K, 6K photo mode. It's a little bit more effective than Olympus's ProCap mode, but those are great features to have for street photography. And our number one pick for street camera is going to be the Fujifilm X-T3. So many positives here. First off, by far the sexiest looking body. But on top of that, the dial controls are very instinctual and classic. It's both fun and also quick to shoot and change on the street. The autofocus is crazy fast and the eye detect is very useful in a street scenario. And it also comes down to that APS-C image quality, which gives it an edge over the Micro Four Thirds camera. All in all, the best pick for street. So as you can tell from my amazing physique, I'm an athlete, and that's why we are at this, I don't know, is this lawn bowling or something? I'm not sure. Squash. Squash. Uh, we're at Squash Court. We're going to talk about sports and wildlife next. The best APS-C or smaller camera for sports and wildlife. All right, so we're gonna start with the Olympus EM1 Mark II, and it does have a lot of good stuff going for it. Insanely fast burst rates, it's a very rugged body, and they do have some interesting lenses, but the Pro Capture mode, although useful, I always found to be a little bit slow and stuttery. It has improved, but there are better cameras out there. All right, now I'm gonna put the Panasonic G9 above the Olympus, but it's not gonna go any higher than that. But here's why. I love the rugged body, I love the great viewfinder, and over the Olympus, I like the 4K, 6K modes better, plus also Panasonic give you longer lenses. And although you can use the excellent Olympus lenses, you get better stability and autofocus when you stick to the native glass. I think the main downside that's gonna throw people off, the contrast only autofocus is gonna be a little bit wobbly and continuous, and although it works, it is disconcerting when you're shooting it. All right, so next is the Fuji X-T3, which has really become their best wildlife and sports camera. First off, you've got great lenses, the 100 to 400, and that new 200 F2 is gonna be very, very exciting. It's compact, and yet if you wanna make it larger to balance lenses, you've got the grip that also provides excellent battery life. But on top of that, the new processor makes this camera insanely fast autofocusing. It's very consistent, and you get a great burst rate. With a crop, you can get up to 30 frames per second, and you can still get almost 20 frames per second with focus confirmation the whole time. So this is a very capable sports and wildlife camera from Fuji. All right, the undisputed champion of sports and wildlife is gonna to go to the Nikon D500. Now, first off, being an SLR, we get big advantages. For example, Nikon having a long legacy of beautiful long lenses. You've got by far the most choices and the mirrorless cameras haven't gotten there yet. But on top of that, an SLR gives you a rugged, stable, heavy platform. That might seem like a downside, but when you're using long lenses, it gives you the balance and the stability that you're looking for. On top of that, I have to say that the Nikon D500 is probably the best autofocusing camera in the world. I even like it better than higher end counterparts like the Nikon D5 because you get better coverage here and I prefer the crop factor for sports and wildlife. It's intuitive, it's easy to use, it focuses accurately. This is still your best choice. All right, so it's time to talk about portrait photography. And when we get into the realm of portrait photography, a lot of it is gonna be things like autofocus capability, but also lens selection and how those lenses render depth of field. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so at the bottom of the list, I'm gonna start things off with the Panasonic G9. And make no mistake, it's got a lot of good stuff going on for it. I actually really like the 6K photo mode for doing portraits, capturing that one facial expression, if you don't mind the resolution loss. There's some amazing portrait lenses that they make, and the eye detect focus I actually find a little bit more effective than the Olympus. However, when we talk about traditional portrait photography, Autofocus is, although useful, not the most critical. I think things like image quality and color are really gonna be the main thing. The Panasonic has beautiful realistic color. I prefer it, but I'm gonna to defer to the masses because most people prefer the Olympus. Okay, so of course Olympus next, and you just heard me talk about all that. You know, Olympus have some beautiful portrait lenses as well. The autofocus is certainly capable for portraiture work, and really it does come down to that color. You know, when you shoot portraits of Olympus, it just has this nice warmth and saturation that is very popular on the market. So that is gonna give the M1 Mark II a slight edge. 
Now the Nikon D500 deservedly earns its second place finish for portraits, a great camera for that. On studio, location sets and stuff like that, the heavier body isn't really gonna hurt you, right? You don't need to worry about traveling long distances with it. At the same time, Nikon have some beautiful lenses, although I do personally feel that they get better, more exciting portrait lenses when they get up into the more telephoto ranges, 85 and above. That's a little bit tight on a crop body, but if you've got the space, they can be brilliant. And on top of that, I've always liked Nikon's color rendition. The 3D focusing is also brilliant. It's a great way to place a point on a person's face, and whether you move closer or farther away, left, right, recompose, it does a great job of tracking them. So the clear winner, it's gonna be the Fujifilm X-T3 for so many good reasons. But first off, let's start with lenses. Fujifilm actually care about APS-C format and make great lenses for it, like the 56 mm 1.2, for example, which is an ideal portrait lens for this crop format with thin, thin depth of field. On top of that, you've got great color science, legendary in fact. Provia, Astia, the Pronegs, they all have great skin tones, but give you different levels of saturation and drama for your portraits. So you get some creative capability there. On top of that, you've got great autofocus and particularly a vastly improved eye detect autofocus, which is when you have it, a very useful tool for getting that pinpoint autofocus, especially when you get into thin depth of field shots. And speaking of thin depth of field, this is a very popular look and both the Nikon D500 and the X-T3 give you this. With that APS-C sensor, you can get that really soft bouquet, really soft dreamy autofocus look. And although I think it's overused, it is definitely very popular in the portrait world. Hey everyone, it's Jordan and let's compare these cameras for video. We went to a movie theater obviously because any one of these cameras is capable, well, no, not really. Some of these cameras are capable of giving you an image you could put on the big screen. And last place out of these cameras is the Nikon D500. This is not a very good video camera. Do I have to say more than that? Something positive. Um, it shoots 4K with a heavy crop. Up next, we've got Olympus's EM1 Mark II, and this is their first really capable camera for video capture. We get 4K in it, and this is by far the most stable camera I've ever used, especially if you've got another Olympus lens with image stabilization in it. However, the data rate is variable and tends to be too low. We had a lot of compression issues, and the preamp for audio is terrible. You'll want to record something externally, so big step in the right direction, but it is a miss. For our runner-up, I've got Panasonic's G9, and it takes a lot of stuff from the great GH5 video capabilities. That's the camera that's shooting me right now. In this, we get 4K60, which is still very rare with full sensor readout on that. And it's a very stable platform, especially if you're using adapted lenses, just slightly behind the EM1 Mark II. However, they took out a lot of my favorite features from the GH5. This has a record limit on it of 29 minutes. You don't get 10-bit recording, no log, no waveforms. It is scaled back a little bit. If you're looking for a hybrid body, this is excellent, but as a primary video capture device, I'd still go for a GH5 or GH5S. Number one with a bullet is the Fuji X-T3, my current crush camera. This one's getting you 10-bit recording internally, 4K 60, it has the Eterna profile, which is my favorite straight out of camera look, bar none, and really great video autofocus performance. Now, it does have a couple limitations. I would love to see IBIS and better battery life in this, but I'm sure we're gonna see those guys shortly on an X-H2 when they rush that out. For the time being though, this is my favorite photo video hybrid on the market. All right, so that does it for our little pro crop body roundup. Hopefully you found that helpful. And really it's about finding the kind of photography that you enjoy and then narrowing down the models that might work best for you. So hopefully this helps you decide that. Then you can go to deepyourview.com and see full reviews and find out if those particular models are an absolute best suit for you at home. Very few photographers out there would tackle all five kinds of photography, but in the rare cases they did, I think we can all agree the Fujifilm X-T3 is a supremely versatile camera and can handle pretty much anything. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget, check out our Instagram and Twitter feeds. Comment below on what you think. Let us know where you think the strengths and weaknesses of these cameras lie. We'd love to hear that. And maybe there's some cameras out there that we've missed. You can certainly give your input there too. Otherwise, we've got many great new videos coming up for you. Until next time.